based around a paper called The Cramlington Way. Before I pass over to Mark Lovett, our deputy head, I'd like to do two things. Firstly, welcome you to the Digital Wraparound Festival, um, to, which is going to lead into our conference on Friday, which has over 270 delegates attending, which is a wonderful, wonderful event. And if you haven't uh, managed to get on it this time, better look next year. We hope to see you then. Um, there are a number of events on over this week. We're starting off tonight with a live stream. There are three flash meetings tomorrow, three flash meetings on Wednesday, a teach meet on Thursday, which will also be streamed, and then the final conference on Friday. You will be able to find all of the information that you need on the page, uh, the conference page, which you have hopefully used to see this video. Um, the other thing I would like to ask is if anybody has any questions for Mark at any point during the um, discussion, and so during the presentation <coughs> and the ensuing discussion, please can you tweet me at chart? I will try and pick up those tweets and I will get through as many questions as we can. But for now, once again, welcome to the CLV Festival of Learning. Um, Mark is going to take us through this document, and I'll pass you over to him now. Um, what I was talking about was the Crabbington Wave. It's a paper that um, our late head teacher, Derek Wise, who really was the vision behind the school, um, put together um, to really try and, and, and capture uh, what Crabbington is about. And what I'd like to do, and I think it's a kind of fitting legacy for Derek, but also lays out a really good context um, for our conference. If I can take you through um, that paper uh, and explain and talk to you about some ideas which kind of formed Cranlington uh, and how we're building on them uh, in a kind of post Derek era. Okay then, <clears throat> if you ask most pupils the purpose of school, um, I guess the response you might get uh, might fall into the following categories. Um, to get qualifications, to get a job, because you've got to. So it begs the question, what, what's the purpose of school? It wouldn't be a real breakthrough if instead um, students replied with to learn the skills I need for the future, to have the knowledge and skills to enable me to be a good citizen and employee, to learn what's important that's gone before and to build on this, uh, to have the skills and confidence to enable me to keep on learning throughout my life and to shape my future and help my community, to learn about our heritage and what makes us a nation so that we move into the future on a common level of knowledge and understanding. And the problem is that we, escape, we equate schools with intelligence, uh, and that schools will make pupils more intelligent. Unfortunately, in the West, we have a narrow view of intelligence. We think that literacy plus numeracy plus memory equals intelligence. Uh, for example, you've only got to have a look at the number of quiz games on TV that rely on memory. Who wants to be a millionaire? Eggheads. University challenge. 1 vs 100, etc. Then we devise an assessment system that primarily tests those literacy, numeracy and memory skills. However, this is starting to wear thin, even at an advanced level where there are growing complaints that A-levels are too much like sat-nav. In other words, students slavishly and without thinking um, recreate their notes in the exam. Academics are also starting to report that today's students are seeking constant advice and appear unable to think for themselves. The premise that the more facts the students acquire, the better educated they are, clearly doesn't square with the views of academics. And time spent learning facts is time not spent doing other things, like thinking. We must therefore help our students to think for themselves, to become independent thinkers, independent learners and inquirers. To this end at Cranton, we use our own learning model, which gives our students opportunities to think like scientists, historians, and be actively involved and responsible for their own learning. What we need is a blend of so-called traditional, content-based, and process-based skills and attributes teaching. Whilst inquiry-based learning may be motivating students and helping to equip them with 21st century skills, we cannot do without the need to acquire subject discipline specific knowledge, without which our students would be unprepared for their exams. We're therefore talking about the need for a blend of pedagogic approaches uh, used appropriately to meet the needs of our students at any given time. It's not just important how we teach, what we teach is also important. A traditional content-led curriculum would certainly enable us to learn about our heritage and the best of what has gone before, but we would argue this is not enough. We must be ambitious for our students. Remember that education is not just schooling, we see the curriculum as also preparing our students for their future, and there's a rapidly growing consensus as to what skills competencies and attributes will be needed in the 21st century. If we have a look at the skills and competencies, our global awareness, environment and world citizenship, 
the ability to find, select, structure, evaluate and present information, creative and critical thinking and problem solving are among some of the skills <coughs> and competencies that increasingly people like Cisco and the learning coming out of the USA is talking about our learners need for the future. However, there appears to be little space in the curriculum to explicitly develop 21st century skills. And as, we, as we've seen, the outcomes of the traditional curriculum are increasingly concerning even those in higher education. We need therefore a blended curriculum, one which can embrace both a traditional content-led approach and a process, skills attract concepts, concepts based approach. Finally, we need to be clear as to what great teaching is. And to do that, we need a clear understanding as to the difference between teaching and learning. The assumption too often is that if I'm a good presenter, enjoy my subject, know a lot about it, have a good classroom management skills, well then I'm well on my way to being a great teacher. Certainly these skills are needed by teachers, but they're not nearly enough. It's not really accurate to complain students forget what they have learned. Why? Because they may never have really learned it in the first place. There's an old joke, isn't there, about uh, the man who says to uh, his neighbour, last night I taught my dog to whistle, and his neighbour says, go on then, let me hear your dog whistle. And the man replies to him, I said I taught him, I didn't say he'd learned. What is learning is students being given the space to come to their own understanding and then checking it out in conversation with both teacher and other students. Student talk rather than teacher talk, encouraging students to think and then reflect on their work is of paramount importance. A great teacher will design lessons that enable this to happen. A great teacher will know from feedback he or she is getting in the classroom whether students are coming to sensible conclusions and intervene if necessary. A great teacher will create an atmosphere of trust in which students feel safe to make mistakes and know that getting stuck or making mistakes is the first step to new learning. Finally, a great teacher will use a full range of teaching methods, continue to combine the visual with auditory and give opportunities for tactile or kinesthetic learning. If feedback in the classroom indicates this of stopping and reteaching using a different approach, so then, teaching for 21st century skills, as well as success in our present system, requires that. There is a blended curriculum, old and new. A blended pedagogy, traditional and non-traditional approach. Giving our students a blend of knowledge, skills, competencies, attributes, and experiences. A mindset which sees students progressively as partners or co-learning in the learning process allowing and valuing students' opinions and acting upon them, bringing to the table students' ICT skills, seeing students as a resource who can teach, support and teach each other. We believe it's possible to teach within a traditional system, looking for traditional outcomes and to develop some of the 21st century skills at the same time. We use a Cromington learning model which embraces various styles of teaching, including inquiry-based learning and project-based learning. So we have the Cranton learning model, plus feedback, plus teachers and students acting on feedback. What we've learned over the years is to make sure we build in feedback into our thinking so we can respond quickly to misunderstandings or change the way we do things. Of course, we've so far focused um, on the heart of what schools should be about, teaching and learning. However, we all know that we don't operate in a vacuum. <clears throat> students don't just bring with them uh, the need for their cognitive abilities to be developed. As a school, the education of the whole child is of huge importance to us. Trying to create good, respectful, well-balanced, self-knowledgeable people who care about others as well as being a good learner. We serve the whole community and we are an inclusive school which works with others in order to meet the unique needs of the individuals who make up our student body. We often use the term personalisation to reflect this and we recognise the need for choice, variety, differentiation and personalised intervention in order to achieve our aspiration for all of our students. How do we make this happen at Cranleton Learning Village? Well, we've created and designed learning environments across the school which facilitate both traditional and non-traditional teaching and learning. We have further ensured that these learning environments are superbly equipped with ICT. Our learning environments encourage collaborative work and enable students to access the information they require when they require it. Because we're asking more of our students and our teachers, continued professional development, CPD, 
is central to what we do. If our teachers need to know more about pedagogy and learning than in most schools, um, their training needs to be integrated into the school week so issues can be quickly addressed and collaborative work undertaken. This is why virtually every Wednesday from 2.15 to 4.15 we devote this time to staff professional development. We have a school-wide approach to teaching and learning with lessons planned and designed using a common framework. The Cramlington learning model uh, ensures consistency. The Cramlington learning model it's good. ensures consistency um, across the curriculum. It's our planning tool. It's what we recognise as what does good teaching and learning look like around here. It gives us a shared vocabulary to inform our discussions about teaching and learning. The Crampton Learning Model helps to promote a blended pedagogy. We differentiate between the following categories, making sure that we use all three. Done for me, done with me, and done by me. We don't simply rely on this to develop independent learners, we anchor in the curriculum for each year a slot in which we guarantee that our students' capabilities for independent thinking and learning are developed. For example, in Year 7 we have our Learning to Learn course, where students learn the importance of the five R's. In Year 8 we have our Transdisciplinary Unit, where students, uh, running, where students plan inquiries around rich or fertile questions and develop information fluency skills. In Year 9 we have Project Humanities, designed to build on and further develop the skills from our transdisciplinary units in Year 8. Within this setting was the concept of time, place and space in a flexible and innovative manner. For up to three weeks a year, the regular timetable was suspended. Also, in the normal curriculum, we have single or even double lessons. So, for example, students can work in depth over the course of the week during Experience Week with a visiting expert in residence, pursue extended inquiry projects both in and out of school and work in much greater depth over a number of days than would ordinarily be provided. They can start something and see it through to the finish, having time to reflect on the process. We call these weeks Experience Weeks. Now, we have three Experience Weeks in Year 7, three more in Year 8, and two in year nine. So by the time a student graduates from year nine, uh, they've gone through eight different experience weeks. We also see the use of space in a non-traditional way. In the junior learning village, we've built a new science facility, the Opening Learning Science Plaza. Now this takes up the space of four traditional science labs where students can move freely through different zones designed for discussion, research, or experimentation. Specifically created double rooms catered for 60 students at a time in humanities, transdisciplinary units and learning to learn so that groups of students can split in the way which suits their needs. The building was built around the concept of a sheltered visit, uh, a sheltered village, which can host exhibitions and village fairs as well as day-to-day -day learning. The junior learning village also features a knowledge cafe, unusually housing both a learning resource centre and the school canteen. The innovative thinking described so far has, of course, transferred into the timetable curriculum. In Year 7, for example, we have Learning to Learn and Secure. Uh, we also have a combined arts approach called Create, which combines drama, music and media. Challenge Wednesday takes place on Wednesday afternoons, and a module humanities course complements the more usual English, Maths, Art, PE, Technology and French. French. Although science is a discrete subject, it's taught in half-day blocks in the Open Plan Learning Plaza, allowing students to take an inquiry approach to science. The aspect of our curriculum described as secure, timetabled lessons, where uh, stands for stretch, explore, push up, or reinforce. This is a guided choice where students are guided um, to the best, uh, the best uh, curriculum um, for them. In Year 7, students take each of the topics below for half a term. Uh, approximately 15, hour, uh, 15 hours. So for example, in Year 7 Secure, um, students may go for a carousel consisting of storytellers, CSI Maths, Super Science, Ready Steady Cook, ICT and Spanish. In Year 8, you can choose to take Spanish for the entire year, or study three out of these five options, Newsroom, Numbers, ICT. Again, there's an opportunity to create G&T classes or reinforce groups for English and maths. 
In year nine, students who opted for Spanish in the previous year would continue. For others, there's a choice to study music for a whole year, or alternatively choose from a range of topics which build on the idea of students engaging with the real-world context. Film production, maths world, food for life, robotics, living art. With respect to personalisation, each student has a personal learning plan, initially created by themselves and their family, which provides a benchmark against which to measure progress. Each student has a learning guide, who is the main point of contact with the school and who has an individual interview five times per week with each of his or her students to assess progress and give advice and support. Parents are able to attend this. So then the characteristics of COV, Cranton Learning Village, combine to form a unique experience for our students. Education is done by you and with you, not for you and to you. There is a blended pedagogy, a blended and flexible curriculum, flexible use of time, space and place, an ICT rich environment, personalisation of learning and personalisation of schooling, continuous professionalism plays a huge part in what we do, independent learners and thinkers is at the heart of what we're about. hope that's giving you um, a brief intro to what we're about at Cramington. Uh, I'm certainly happy um, to take any questions and answer them if I can. Uh, I'm very, very much looking forward to welcoming guests at our teaching on Thursday and at our conference on Friday. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. For um, That must be the third or fourth time that we've been through this document and really means an awful lot to all of the people who are teaching and working in this school. So thanks for illuminating us on that. And we have a number of questions which have come through on Twitter. So I will take the um, first question from uh, at ICP Jones. Um, and she asks, um, how do you develop students' resilience so that they don't stop trying <laughs> sorry, that they don't stop trying at the first hurdle? So how do we actually work on developing resilience with our students? Okay. Um, this camera grab? Okay. Okay. Um, in terms of resilience, I mean, I, I'm going to say, you know, you talk about it, you practice it, you reflect on it, uh, and then you reward it. Now, talk about it means you have to give it a language, give it a name, uh, and explain what it is. And um, practice it means you have to build in opportunities for kids to practice being resilient. Um, and, and that's where things like an extended inquiry uh, comes in. Uh, and then there's a debrief of that inquiry where you unpack the process and where students needed to be resilient and how they were resilient. Uh, and then you reward it. So, for example, we've replaced the, um, the old effort and behaviour um, awards with, with reviews around our, our five R's. Um, in a sense, with effort, where do you go with that? You know, you tried hard, so you get a five. You didn't try so hard, so you get a one. I don't really know you, but it's going back to the parents, so I'll give you a three, because that's, uh, uh, that's not going to upset anyone. Uh, and what do you do if you get a one for effort? You know, you, you try harder. Um, so we've replaced effort and behaviour with grades around the five R's. So now we have grades for resilience from one through to five, from bronze through to gold. And we have steps from one to two to three to four. And we work, or our teachers work with students to say, OK, what would you need to do to move from a bronze to silver in resilience? So we talk about it. We give students the opportunity to practice it. Uh, we reflect on it and we build it into um, both our review system and our reward system. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, we have certainly one viewer, at least one viewer, who has got up at 4 o'clock this morning to watch this presentation. Good morning. Good morning, from Australia. So we have an Aussie question from uh, Vicky Miles in Victoria, and she asks, what influences Cramington's thinking and practice the most? Well, hi, Vicky. You know, well done for getting up at four o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, I hope it's been worth it so far. Um, I, I think what's central to our thinking is three things. You know, we tend to think about engagement. Um, how do we engage kids in school and schooling? How do we convince kids that school is a worthwhile place to be? Uh, but engagement also is about engaging students in learning. And how do we tool kids up with a kind of like toolbox to give them the skills to engage with us in learning? Um, the second one is achievement. You know, what works in the classroom to help kids to make progress 
and to really achieve their full potential. Uh, and one of the books we're reading at the moment is Jeff Petty, uh, Evidence-Based Teaching and Learning, but we've also uh, read books by Professor Hackey. So um, we're learning what works in terms of achievement. And the other thing is that uh, Colours are, are thinking is developing independent learners and thinkers. Uh, influences on us have been Alistair Smith uh, and his work on accelerated learning. Um, you know, more recently, the Learning Futures Initiative and the idea of learning commons and learning in school and out of school and an inquiry approach to learning. Uh, and Jeff Petty, uh, evidence-based teaching and learning is something we're reading at the moment uh, to really come like, to look at what really works in the classroom. But central to our thinking is engagement, engaging kids in school and schooling, achievement, uh, and developing independent learners and thinkers. Um, another question then from Rosanna Blakesley, who's <coughs> at RBL Teach. And she asks, how would you ensure that good practice gets disseminated to all staff? Okay. Um, how do we ensure good practice gets uh, disseminated to all staff? Well, really the answer is, is we invest um, a huge amount of time and thinking and resource into continued professional development. Um, I, I guess we believe that um, high quality continued professional development is a right for professional people um, <coughs> and not a chore. So, for example, uh, every Wednesday afternoon from 2.15 to 4.15, um, you know, our Year 7 8 students do Challenge Wednesday. Um, our old students go home and between 2.15 and 4.15, that's time for people in departments to get together and spend two hours uh, collaborating on schemes of work or involved in inset in service programs. Um, if you um, join this school um, in September, uh, you'd have a three-day induction program uh, into our teaching and learning model. And three months later, we'd take you away to a residential hotel uh, and we'd revisit teaching and learning. Uh, we have a two and a half day teaching and learning conference for all 126 of our teaching staff uh, every year. That's how we make use of our, um, <coughs> our teacher days. And we come back to the Crampton cycle. We have an NQT for newly qualified teachers program, which runs every four weeks throughout the first year. We have an NQT plus one. Um, for people in their second year of teaching and just recently we've added an NQT plus two which is about 21st century teaching. So we invest an enormous amount of time into continued continue professional development uh, and giving people an opportunity to talking uh, about learning and that keeps us pretty consistent but it's that, it's that teaching and learning model, the Cramlington cycle I have to say, which is really at the heart of everything we do uh, and we tend to um, shape all of our uh, CPD around getting better at using that teaching and learning model. Okay, thank you. Actually picking up on that, there's a, a fresh tweet that's just come in from um, Jamie Portman at Camp Smart School, and he has asked, what has been the biggest obstacle to embedding the Cramlin Learning Cycle across the whole school, and how did you overcome it? Uh, good question, Jamie. How are you doing? Um, I think the answer, in short, is, is not, not, it wasn't a quick fix. Um, it was over time, it was over a number of years. Uh, we've always started with a kind of, well, any new initiative we brought in, we've always started with a, a, a kind of like pilot, pilot, toe in the water, try it, followed by an embed it, come back this time, let's do it properly, followed by a spread it approach. So, uh, in fact, at our school, um, we started with the Crumpton, or as it was then, accelerated uh, learning cycle, and we tried it out in a couple of departments who were keen to give it a go. Um, so at the time, uh, back in 1997, uh, I was head of science, and um, the science part were keen to give the accelerated learning cycle, as it was called then. Uh, we'd recently had a, you know, a day by Alistair Smith. Uh, he did a fantastic inset day for us. Uh, and we decided we we're going to use the accelerated learning cycle in science to try out one or two schemes of work. Um, they worked, they worked well, we asked the kids, the kids loved it, so we got some kind of immediate feedback from the students. Uh, then another big department came on board, Humanities, they tried it, they loved it. So we had two big departments who have been taking that kind of accelerated learning cycle, which later evolved into the Crimington teaching and learning model, um, had, had tried it and, and experienced a great deal of success with it. Um, so thereafter, we said, look, two big departments have done this, it's worked really well. 
So unless you've got any reason why um, you wouldn't plan lessons without learning outcomes, or you wouldn't make lesson learning outcomes clear for kids, why you wouldn't have an activity for kids to process learning or understanding, why you wouldn't ask kids to demonstrate what they'd learned, uh, why you don't think it's important for kids to review those learning, we now, like everybody, um, to engage with the Cramerton teaching learning model and begin to rewrite schemes of work around it. Now, firstly, we gave people time. Um, it's not something you do overnight. It was a three to five year program for us. Secondly, we removed obstacles by workplace reforms. So, for example, um, you know, engaging two web designers, then a the third web designers, to take some of that work which teachers were trying to do out of their hands. Um, you know, the web designers were now doing it and teachers had time to concentrate on teaching and learning. By doing things like creating the Wednesdays, 2.15 to 4.15, giving people time again to work um, on schemes of work and really taking away, I guess, those excuses or those things that, that get in the way um, of, of um, you know, taking the initiatives forward. I think I probably haven't fully answered your question there, Jamie, but it's given you kind of like, you know, um, some ideas and, and really mate, we'd be here all night if uh, I, was I was taking you through it. But, uh, I'll see you at the conference and uh, we'll have a couple of beers after and I'll take you through it then in more depth. Um, great. Well, we have one last question and that is about leadership in particular. And obviously the Cranlington Way was a document which was initially penned <coughs> by Derek Wise, uh, the former head of the school. And the final question basically is, what lessons have you and the school leadership taken away from Derek Wise's leadership? Okay. <coughs> Derek, Derek was a great... Um, friend to me for a long number of years and you know I feel his loss very keenly. Um, he's also a great mentor to me uh, and if I had to um, try to encapsulate you know, like three things which Derek I feel taught me uh, and things which kind of help us drive the school forward it would be um, that in schools often the urgent drives out the important. So often in schools we're so busy firefighting that we forget to kind of look up uh, and see the horizon and remember what's important about what we're doing. So what Derek did was very cleverly separate the urgent from the important. He did that structurally through creating different teams. The other thing that Derek taught me was that you need to spend as much time focusing on process, the how you go about doing something, as the content, the what uh, you want to do. So planning how you introduce something in some detail and giving that attention and time is as important as the what uh, you want to do. Uh, and the third thing, which really describes Eric for me, he would use the word pragmatopian, uh, which really meant that uh, you know, he had his feet on the ground, uh, but his head in the clouds. Uh, and that's something I'll, uh, I'll keep with me as well. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much, Mark, for um, what I know has been quite an intense half hour there. Um, some great questions. Um, thank you very much for sending those questions in. Can we remind you that the rest of the Digital Wrap Around Conference, CLB Digital, will continue with tomorrow three flash meetings uh, on Wednesday, a further three flash meetings. If you've never taken part in a flash meeting, it's an online discussion. You'll need a webcam and a microphone, or if your laptop has a built-in microphone, and you'll be able to discuss with members of staff the questions which are on the digital wraparound um, site, which you can access through www.cramlingtonlv.co.uk. Um, follow us, please, on Twitter. And if you wish to follow discussions around the festival, it is hashtag CLV Festival. Or if you want to follow the Twitter account, at CLV Festival. Then on Thursday night, after we've had the flash, the flash meetings, um, we will be having a Teach Me in School. Um, and the vast majority of our audience are people who have come and travelled quite a long way. We have um, definitely one person from New Zealand, another person from Australia, some people from uh, Barnsley or somewhere like that. I've never really heard yes. of that place. Um, and they are coming up to school and joining on our teach, with us on our Teach Meet on Thursday evening. A Teach Meet is an informal get-together um, where we will be sharing best practice from what is actually going on in our classrooms at this current time. And that will be live streamed out, so you will be able to participate in that remotely if you wish. Again, the details are on the website. And then finally, that brings us to Friday, which is for us one of the most important dates on the educational calendar. There are other conferences which try to uh, be similar to the Kremlin Conference, but sometimes fail quite miserably. Um, this is the best conference ever. 
you will you will be delighted if you are um, coming along to it. If you are not, as I say, keep an eye on the school website and make sure that you come along to next year's conference. Can I finally say thank you very much for uh, tuning in, and we hope that has been a useful and informative evening. Good night.